Good afternoon. Welcome to Introversion in the Workplace. Is America overlooking treasure? And I think you can see my bias already. I believe that we are overlooking treasure. Before I start, I'd like to point out that a funny thing happened to me on the way to the forum, as a consequence of which, if you downloaded any of my slides that I sent into the forum two days after I got out of the hospital, still with anesthesia in me, they won't exactly match what I'm showing you today, and there is no handout. If you'd like to leave me your business card with slides written on it, I can send you the presentation for today. And I will be available for dialogue after the talk. And I hope you will want a lot of dialogue because I have 20 minutes to tell you about a lifetime of experience. Okay, uh, I am a psychologist. I'm a trainer that helps introverts and extroverts connect and communicate in the workplace. I'm a coach that helps what I call corporate refugees people whose temperament doesn't fit with their corporate culture and they're exhausted, bright, dedicated, and exhausted trying to get ahead and become visible. And I help them to do that without becoming extroverts. You don't have to become an extrovert to become visible. There are ways introverts can do it. I know those ways. Uh, I'm also a lifelong introvert. Now, I say that we live in an extrovert culture, and here's my first piece of evidence. Who's that? John, okay, everybody knows. All over the world, I could do this in Inner Mongolia, they'd say John Wayne. Who's that? Okay, I'll tell you who he is. As a graduate student at Harvard in the art department, he worked in the museum, saw an old card catalog being given away, made each of the tiny drawers in the card catalog a different experiment in how different art, art materials degraded over time found out how to conserve them, how to keep them from degrading, how to restore them, wrote the first textbook on the conservation of art. Later in World War II, he was a member of the Monuments Men. Have you heard of that unit? The unit that went in the advancing forces to save art treasures from massive destruction. Uh, it's a proud moment in our history that we did that. It's, it's a first in military history, for a matter of fact. Why do I put these two guys together? Well, I'll tell you why. If you go into Iowa on Highway 80, you will see signs that say, Winterset, Iowa, birthplace of John Wayne. And you can go in and tour his house. If you look up George Stout on the internet, which is where you'll have to find him, you'll sooner or later say, George Stout, born in Winterset, Iowa, birthplace of John Wayne. What do we value? Well, here's another one. This is more scientific evidence. Onus and Dilcrest did this study in 2009 of leadership in corporations. The top bar, you'll see there's 16% in the green bar. That represents the percentage of people in the population that they were studying that were extreme extroverts. The black bar, 34%, represents people above average in extroversion. The 50% is people below average in extroversion. Guess who that is? Introverts, uh-huh. 50%, and that's a real figure. That's not an illusion. Now look at what happens as we go up the managerial levels. You see that the introverts are not very well represented at the supervisory level, and we dwindle more and more until at the top there are only 2% of CEOs. You'll also notice that the people who are above average in extroversion dwindle somewhat, but look at the color that grows. The extreme extroverts take over more and more as we go up the leadership levels, and we think in the United States that's right and just. These are the step forward, take charge people. They should be in charge, right? Wrong. If you answered right, I'll throw you out right now. Wrong. <laughs> We're going to explore this today, especially if I can get this thing to work. <laughs> there is another slide after this. Can you help me? There we go. Who is this guy? He's a CEO losing sleep at night because he's, a scare he's afraid that there's a kid in a garage in Silicon Valley inventing something that's going to put his company out of business. And that is a very real fear of CEOs nowadays. Now, the likelihood of having this kid in the silicone gar garage in his corporation, is very, it's very unlikely because the kid in the garage is very independent and working on his own, not so in a corporation. In fact, uh, Gallup in their survey of the American workforce found that in innovation and productivity depend on employee engagement. They also found that only 13% of employees in the U.S. were engaged, that is, coming to work enthusiastic and energized and ready to give their best. And then they found that the most powerful influence on employee engagement is the immediate supervisor. 
wait a minute, didn't we just look at a graph that said the immediate supervisor was often very, very different from the employees? 50% of the employees were uh, introverts, and yet the immediate supervisors were very different. And I can tell you from having interviewed people in corporations, from line workers all the way on up to CEOs, CFOs, uh, sales managers, that they don't get the differences nor what they need to do to really tap into what I call quiet brilliance. Okay. In other words, over 50% of the population is being led by two or at most 15% who don't understand who in the heck we are, how our brains work, and what are optimal circumstances in order for us to be able to perform at our best. A sad affair indeed. Okay, so here's an assumption. People need stimulation in order to stay motivated. That's actually true. We all need stimulation. Introverts too, social stimulation. We just need much less of it. Why? Extrovert brains need more stimulation to stay alert and awake. That's why at conferences, for example, they'll often, right before the lunch sessions, play loud music. You've been to conferences like that? Even in business meetings, and they'll even have somebody lead you in exercises to get your blood roaring, you know, so that you can, it can concentrate on the afternoon session. I mentioned this to an extrovert friend, and she said, I absolutely need that. And I said, well, that is an introvert's idea of hell. <laughs> and that is because introvert brains take in more stimulation. If you put an introvert and an extrovert side by side in the laboratory, measuring brain activity, and you bombard them with the same amount of stimulation, the same quality of stimulation, you will find that the introvert brain lights up a lot more. Introvert brains are picking up more stimuli and more nuances. Is this a bad thing? I don't think so for creativity to be more alert to things in your environment. Furthermore, the brain of an introvert needs less outside stimulation. That doesn't mean we don't need it. We need less. Okay. Also, Randy Buckner at Harvard found that uh, introverts have more internal stimulation. What does that mean? It means we take all this stuff that comes in, and the area of the brain that processes and analyzes stimulation, it's thicker in introverts. We're processing and analyzing. Is this a bad thing for creativity? Another thing that introverts do that's stimulating is we will drill down and really learn a topic just for the fun of it. I have introvert friends who are experts in geology. It's not their career or physics or just because they wanted to study it. Introverts are often great readers. In a forum I was in recently on the internet, people asked introverts, what's your favorite sport? And many of us said, reading. So we're filling up with internal stimulation we have a lot to offer the world if we can just get it out. Here's one of my favorite quotes from Stephen Hawking. Quiet people have the loudest minds, and he should know because he lives a life of the mind. The cartoon below that shows the same little stick figure. On your left is the stick figure with, I think, a depiction of the mind of an introvert. It's jam-packed with fancy patterns. That's very much like the introverts I know. Just jam-packed. On the right is the same, and it says, what I think. On this right side is the stick figure saying what I say, and out comes one or two words. All of us who are introverts have experienced that in a situation where we bleat out something and go home and are embarrassed afterwards because we had no idea how we could get around this topic and respond to it. So one of the things we have to remember is that the brain of an introvert, think of an introvert as being having a, a, a room filled with file cabinets. We've taken in all the stimulation, we've analyzed it, we've processed it. And in order to access it, we go into this room and we have to run up and down the corridors and pull out drawers and find the right files and maybe find a file over there to put together to answer a reasonable request. That's what happens to us when we get a question fired at us that we're not expecting, particularly in a public situation. And for an introvert, two or more people is a public situation. It doesn't have to be a large group. So rule number one in working with introverts is don't spring surprises on introverts. I'll be giving you a list at the end, but I will tell you right now, uh, never have a meeting without an agenda that's given out in advance so that introverts can access these files and give meaningful input. Don't spring surprises on introverts. I was at a conference recently and an executive coach said, oh, I tell leaders this is what you should do. When you have a quiet person in your group, you point and you say, Caroline, what do you think about that? And I said, that is the rock bottom worst advice you could give, because if you do this to an introvert in public, here is what you will get. <laughs> right? The deer in the headlights phenomenon. 
And the more this happens to the introvert, the more nervous that person is going to get, and the less likely they are to want to participate in future group meetings. There are ways around that. Don't worry, I will get to that before the end. But let's throw away, let's look at this uh, stimulation that people need the same amounts of stimulation in order to stay motivated. No, different for introverts and extroverts. Here's another assumption in our culture. The research goes back 60 years and we haven't learned from it. In any group, the person who speaks up first and speaks the most is likely to be looked at as the de facto leader. Their opinion will be respected, they'll be consulted more and more, and the quiet introvert sitting there processing and looking frantically for information to participate in the discussion is left out of the discussion. In the original study, they not only showed that this is the person who became the leader, but when a quiet person later on proposed a solution to the task that they were working on, that person was brushed aside and not listened to. Does this happen in corporate culture? Oh, you bet. I had a coaching client a few years ago, quiet and brilliant, who tried to tell her manager that she felt their corporation was at risk because they were not aware of possible crises that could come in the future and they had no contingency plans in place. And he poo-pooed her and he brushed her aside and he wrote up on her a performance review that she sat upright in meetings with her hands in her lap. I didn't think that was an appropriate performance review. The conflict between them became so great, and I wasn't coaching him, just her. She had a stress breakdown, she left the company, and two years later, guess what happened? They did have a crisis, and they had, were in no position to handle it because they were totally surprised, and they need not have been if they had listened to this quietly brilliant people. Listen, okay. So, you know, when you don't speak up, people start to assume you're not motivated, or you don't care, or you don't know, or you're, even that you're dumb. I, in my lifetime, have been treated as if I was dumb in certain groups because I wasn't speaking up. And it's a very demeaning thing to one's self-esteem, so we have to find ways to get around that. Uh, assumption number three, introverts aren't good leaders. Ha! We saw in that early graph that introverts are not promoted to leadership positions very often, but Jim Collins, in his book, Good to Great, studied corporations, companies that moved from being simply good to being great and the major factor was the CEO, and many of the characteristics of these good to great CEOs were introvert characteristics. Furthermore, let me get this. Uh, Adam Grant at the Wharton School of Business studied different groups and found that introverts are great leaders for groups in which people have ideas. Why? The introverts will listen and be willing to incorporate other ideas in the overall plan. An extrovert leader is more likely to say, here's the plan, follow me, men, and start marching off in that direction. So extrovert leaders were better for groups where it was really simply a question of giving commands to people and getting them to do it. And do we need both? Probably. Oh, this is my, one of my favorite cartoons because introverts are often very independent. We're not groupies. We don't hang around in large groups, at coffee break or lunch or go out after work. We're by ourselves or a couple of other people. We go home and we're quiet. That means we're less susceptible to group think. So you see the lemmings jumping over the cliff and one way back in the line, a leader in the making is saying, whoa, just as my coaching client was trying to say whoa to this corporation that was about to go off a cliff and nobody saw it except her. Okay, so let's toss the assumption that introverts aren't good leaders. We're very good leaders. Why should we care? Well, here's, introverts are 51 to 57 percent of the population. These figures are from Myers-Briggs, who ought to know, and they took them over, repeatedly over 10 years. Thousands and thousands of people involved in this study. You may see studies that say 20 to 30 percent introverts. I don't believe them. I do know that introverts often are very clever and will lie or shade the results of a test they take because they don't want people to know that they fit this negative stereotype in American culture. <clears throat> We may be as much as 75% of the gifted. There's less research to support this, but we're at least 50% of the gifted, meaning IQ is over 160. D uh, dangerous to overlook our input. You can't tell an introvert by looking. For example, introverts aren't shy. There are shy extroverts, too. That's social anxiety. You can see an introvert being very sociable and outgoing, and we can do it, and we can do it easily when we know how to do it. It's just that we do need to retreat and recover our energy. So you, can't, you don't know how many introverts are around you in the workplace. I will tell you this, Stunner, though. 
I have a LinkedIn profile, and I stress the fact that I work on the topic of introversion. The people who contact me, not the ones who give me business cards at meetings, but just out of a clear blue sky are looking on the internet for introversion. And of the, those that contact me, over half, probably three or four out of five, are men. Middle and upper level management men who are suffering in their jobs uh, and not likely to go any higher because they're not being recognized or given the support they need to get ahead. Here's an even more stunning one, and I, I really shocked me when I started to keep track. Four out of five of the women who contact me are African-American women. Now, I thought about these two things, the men and the African-American women, and I mentioned it to a friend of mine who's a, an experienced human resources manager and an African-American woman, and she said, do you know why? And I said, well, I think it's because these two groups have a stereotype of being the strong, take charge leader. And that's fine if that's their natural temperament. But if that isn't the kind of leadership quality they have, then they're suffering and they're having to act out a role that is really draining them on a daily basis. And she, she nodded. So that's at least two of us from this non-scientific, non-random study that agree that there's something interesting here going in, uh, worth looking into. And I will be looking into that more and more. Okay, what do extroverts leaders need to remember about introverts to set up an inclusive group? Well, first of all, we need time to reflect. You know, there's a, uh, for uh, an office, uh, what do you call them, office component company now, Steelcase, that puts out a Susan Cain room, a quiet room, but managers need to recognize that an introvert may need to go into that room and be quiet and reflect in order to function at maximal level. We need to have advance notice, such as agendas. I have a friend who's a coach in the technology industry, and she said, oh, things happen so fast in technology, you don't have time to do that. And I said, well, you have time to send a text message while running down the hall to the meeting, don't you? Even that much warning helps the introvert to start to retrieve information to participate. Introverts do need invitations to participate. Uh, that went too fast now. <clears throat> uh, saying to an, uh, an employee, we're going to be talking about this topic tomorrow and I'd really like your input. Will you give it some thought? Would you give me a few written thoughts? Brainstorming. Okay, I have two minutes left. Okay. Brainstorming can be dangerous for introverts unless you brainstorm in a chat room on, on the internet and introverts are very happy to put things in writing. They can do it much more easily than speaking out in public. All right, what do introverts need to recognize about extroverts? Well, that that extrovert energy isn't necessarily either aggressive or phony. Unfortunately, introverts tend to think that, and we have to get rid of that thinking because it gets in the way of our connecting and communicating. A great leader can virtually eliminate employee disengagement and the company, and remember, introverts are everywhere. I love this. We're your employers, employees, I had one woman tell me, I, now, I get, I, now I understand my boss better after she heard my talk. We're your colleagues, we're your clients and customers. I had a sales manager say to me, I never hire introverts. And I said, do you sell to introverts? We're 51% of the population at least, and people need to understand us. Okay, my final thought, if you have an ineffective employee, I always say to people, ask yourself, did you hire them that way? Or did you make them that way? Thank you.